So here we are at the end of a busy week uh, at the uh, unique species on a unique planet question mark conference in Copenhagen, Denmark, right next, actually we're in a park right next to the Institute of Science, which used to be the veterinary school at the University of Copenhagen. And I'm with an old uh, contact, well, not literally old, but uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> who I first met in on the island of Capri at a Bioastronomy 96 conference way back when. That was what, uh, I can't do the math, 2024, 1996. Right. That's uh, almost 30 years ago. Right. And uh, we're still grappling with the same astrobiological questions. That's the... That's the interesting thing. But uh, Steve gave a, a great talk this morning on the societal impact of astrobiology as a whole on society and culture and also what contact might mean. Uh, Steve, tell us, first of all, what has changed in your own mind? I, I think I mentioned this before we get into your talk. What has changed in the 28 years since we both attended the 96 conference and we're fast forward to 2024. We know there are a lot more planets out, extrasolar planets out there now. A, 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 you know, a fair variety of them. That's but, just what I was going to say. That 90, 1996 was so interesting, the meeting in Capri in Italy, because uh, it was the year after the announcement of the, uh, of the first uh, uh, exoplanets uh, planets going around a sun-like star. Uh, I, w I had just come out with a book at that time called The Biological Universe, and uh, I was in page proof when that was announced. And I had, <laughs> I had a, a table in my book about how many times planets had been announced beyond the solar system, which turned out to be wrong. And so I put a footnote in in page proof saying, well, here's another one. But that turned out to be the beginning. Uh, that one was real. Uh, 51 Pegasus, it was called. And... Uh, and that turned out to be real, and now we know of thousands, over 5,000 uh, planets around stars. Virtually, basically virtually every star is going to have planets. Uh, not all Earth-like habitable planets, most of them are, are gas giants, but the, uh, there are uh, some uh, Earth-like um, planets, uh, or Earth-sized planets, I should say, in the, in the habitable zone. So that's a big uh, research project that keeps going on now. I'd say that's actually the major advance in the almost 30 years since uh, uh, since we met at that meeting in uh, in Capri. And uh, we still don't really have, I mean, Rare Earth, the, the book Rare Earth by Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee came right. out in 2002 and caused a, a, a big news flap. And some of the tenets of Rare Earth are still applicable. Depends on who you ask. But we, we don't really have a solar system analog, do we? Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, there's a, we, uh, we know of many planetary systems, especially the Trappist system, which has, I think, seven planets or something like that. But there's no analog that has a, a, a system that has an Earth in, a, in the habitable zone and looks like it's not only Earth-sized, but Earth-like, uh, and where life might have uh, developed. So uh, it looks like we're fairly, uh, uh, I wouldn't say unique because we don't have a large enough sample yet so uh, we're just beginning to find out what kind of planets there are and of course the small planets like the earth are more difficult to find because they're so small so uh, astrobiology as a discipline certainly has not given up on the, the idea of life out there and in fact uh, uh, I think uh, the, all of these planets uh, that exist uh, you know increase the likelihood that there, there is life out there but of course we can't assume what we want to prove and that's why astrobiology keeps going uh, so, so strongly and why I'm starting to uh, think about and, and have written about uh, the societal impact if we do find something. And you uh, I don't know if I mentioned this at the top I just want to make sure that that you are both a former uh, historian at the US Naval Observatory in Washington mm -hmm. right and you are also the NASA chief historian for several years before That's right. you stepped down in 2009. That's right. So uh, your talk kind of divides up the societal impact or cultural impact in three categories. Can you briefly give us a like a sentence or two on the the first on the uh, the biological universe? Uh, uh, tell me. Well, I talked about uh, cosmic evolution 
You know, the, the universe is 13.8 uh, billion years old. And it seems to me that there are three possible endpoints to that uh, evolution. One is just a physical universe where we have planets, stars, and galaxies. Another one is a biological universe where life is common. Um, and a third one that uh, a lot of people have not thought about, but uh, I've written about, is the post-biological universe where biology has actually uh, evolved beyond bio the biological to the post-biological, in other words, uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, that's what I talked about in the in the in the in the, um, the post-biological universe. I mean, now there's this huge debate about the you know the ramifications of AI here on Earth. Uh, you know, if you're in the stock market, that can be good for your wallet. But other than that, uh, there are a lot of people who are worried that AI could basically make humans uh, irrelevant. That's right. The uh... Uh, you know, the singularity is near, is what Ray Kurzweil said 20 years ago. And now he's just come out with a book, The Singularity is Nearer. And now, what do you, uh, characterize what you mean by, by the singularity? singularity he, he means that artificial intelligence uh, will take over from, uh, from, bio, uh, from us and, um, you know, will we'll, um, yeah, basically take over. So it may, and, it'll be kind of like a Matrix-style uh, world where uh, there's an artificial uh, reality created by artificial intelligence is what you're saying possibly possibly yes or or no uh no biologicals at all just post biologicals my point is that if this is about to happen on the earth and you can <laughs> you can consider that optimistic or pessimistic whichever way you want but if that's happened about to happen on the earth and out there in outer space where you know you've had uh, millions and billions of years to for cultural evolution um, then it's uh, it's likely, I think, that uh, that life has gone past the biological to the post biological, and this has uh, implications for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence because you might be looking for something quite different than you think you are if you're looking for biologicals. So two last questions. One, how do you explain the Fermi paradox? Because we at that meeting in '96, you know, SETI, the, the SETI people, the people from the SETI Institute and other institutes right. who were looking for radio signals, of intelligent signals, in both the radio and then some in the optical. Uh, now people are looking for technosignatures of Dyson spheres and, and astro, astro engineering on even larger scales from really advanced civilizations. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the Fermi paradox, that, which is... Tell us what the Fermi Paradox is and what's your take on it. Well, the Fermi Paradox uh, is uh, the idea that, okay, if there's so many intelligences, so many civilizations out there, then why don't we see them? Or why aren't they here? Of course, some people say they are here. The, 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 <laughs> the UFO or the UAP, as it's called, the Unidentified Aerial uh, Phenomena or Anomalous Phenomena. Um, but um, in my view, that's uh, there's not enough evidence uh, that they are here. Right. So then the question is, are they out there? Well, we haven't seen them out there either. So can you conclude that therefore they don't exist? Uh, I don't think so because, uh, I mean, it is a serious argument because the calculations show that if you, even if you have one civilization and it spreads and you've got millions of years to spread, they would have been here by now. Uh, they would have colonized the galaxy and we, don't, we just don't see that. But there are lots of... Uh, uh, lots of ways around that, you know, maybe they don't like to travel. Uh, the best thing to do, I think, is to actually search. Um, I mean, the Fermi Paradox is a nice theory, but you always like to have the observations and see, uh, you know, if, if they're out there. So far, it's been unsuccessful, but I don't think it's time to give up yet. And so what's uh, your last thing? What should we be, be doing that we aren't doing? And how do you respond to people who say astrobiology and the search for life beyond our own Earth we have so many problems. We have climate change problems. We have poverty. We have disease. We have you know, pandemics. Uh, what do you? How do you respond to people who say, "I don't want my money spent on space"? <laughs> right. Well, I got I got a lot of that when I was a NASA historian. Uh, <laughs> that uh, why don't why don't we just spend the money here on Earth? And of course, working for NASA, NASA is the premier agency for exploration, and I think it's an humans have an exploration imperative they they're if you're curious you want to know what's out there so uh, you know there's also the debate about robotic versus human but i think we need to do both R humans are much more uh efficient than r robotic spacecraft so i think we do need to uh go out and explore and we we need to have a balance you can worry about the problems on earth and and fund some of that but also uh, a minimal amount i mean the nasa budget is uh 
only about $25 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a few percent of the defense budget. Right. And I think it's well worth it to uh, use that money and go out and explore while still caring for the people on Earth. Well, thanks so much, Steve, for taking the time. Always great to, to see you, and, uh, and good luck with your next book. Okay, thanks a lot.